This is the module on randomized control trial evaluations in the long run from the Partnership for Economic Policies Policy Impact Analysis course. Randomized control trials have been used fruitfully for policy evaluation and formulation in developing countries in the last two to three decades. Their intensive use in recent years has sparked a recent debate on how useful they can be and what problems they might have. On the one hand, some critiques have pointed out that these are local partial equilibrium studies that concentrate on small-scale results, and these small experiments will not capture or cannot capture spillover and general equilibrium effects on the broader economy. On the other hand, they focus on small questions. Social experiments, critiques will argue, have limited value because they focus on a very small set of interventions, which by definition work only in a very narrowly defined context and are not informative about big questions regarding economic development in the long run. In another module in this course we have studied spillover effects and externalities in experiments that allow us to partially address these critics. In this module, we will show that experiments can measure the impact in the medium and long run, and by doing so, we can focus on important and big questions on longer run economic development. In this module, we will cover material that shows how randomized control trials cover far more than these local and specific program impact evaluations. We have already covered complex designs and experiments that capture spillovers and externalities. We will now concentrate on the assessment of long-run effects of development policies from health interventions to cash transfer programs. The first case study is that of the deworming and schooling outcomes in Kenya, concentrating on their impact after 20 years. The paper is called 20-Year Economic Impacts of Deworming in Kenya and is a manuscript from 2020 by Michael Kramer, Edward Miguel, and colleagues. The original paper is a seminal publication in Econometrica, which was one of the reasons why Michael Kremer was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics. The intestinal worms infect about one quarter of the world population, and they imply a high burden of disease, for instance in terms of stunting and anemia, especially for young children in Africa and Asia. Treatment for this disease is cheap and relatively easy. It can be administered orally and it costs less than 50 cents per child. Miguel and Kramer evaluate a Kenyan project in which school-based mass treatment with deworming drugs was randomly phased into schools rather than to individuals. When the medical treatment is randomized at the individual level, we are potentially underestimating the benefit of these treatments because we are missing the externality benefits to the comparison group from reduced disease transmission and also underestimating the benefits for the treatment group. This was covered in the module on spillover and general equilibrium effects and externalities in this course. The results from the original study by Kremer and Miguel in 2004 indicate that the short-run mass deworming led to schooling gains and community health benefits at a low cost, with serious infections falling by half from 52 to 25 percent, reducing absenteeism and improving the health conditions of untreated children that benefited from having less children infected around them, and thus not having contagion. These externalities are large enough to justify fully subsidizing the treatment. Miguel and Kremer studied the effects of this program after 20 years based on the follow-up of these 75 primary schools with a population of 30,000 children. The deworming treatment was experimentally phased in in the original project. This is the deworming project PSDP in Kenya. This new study has several methodological contributions. On the one hand, the Kenya Life Panel Survey covers the period 1998 to 2019. There are few longitudinal databases that track children into adulthood, even less so in Africa. This was a sample of more than 7,500 individuals that were tracked over time, with data collected on income, living standards, and other life outcomes. Such comprehensive measures of living standards are not common in surveys in developing countries, 
and the data set is unique in the sense that it follows individuals as they migrate within the country and outside of it by contacting them frequently over their cellular phones. The first table, Table 1 in the paper, shows the effects from 10 to 20 years of the deworming program. We can see in Column 1 for the full sample that the program induced a statistically significant increase in per capita consumption of about $305. We also observe some positive effects in other outcomes such as per capita earnings and for some subgroups, for instance, in individual earnings for older people. Table 2 in the same paper looks at labor supply, earnings, occupation, and sectoral choice. The evidence indicates that these individuals not only have higher individual earnings, but they also have a higher proportion of adults residing in an urban area and of adults employed in waged work. To sum up, in the 10-year evaluation of the program, the authors found that the two to three additional years of the deworming induced by the program implied labor market gains 10 years down the road by 2007 to 2009 and also improved health and education outcomes. The 20-year outcomes on which we concentrate in this presentation indicate that the treatment increased consumption and earnings by more than 6 to 14 percent with gains in per capita consumption of more than $300 a year, higher hourly individual earnings by 18%, and overall larger living standards, productivity gains, mostly for males, and shifts into non-agricultural activities and migration to urban areas. The authors also carried out a cost-benefit analysis. They gave good arguments to show that, as an investment, deworming has a very high rate of return. The cost is fairly low, and it consists of the deworming pills that are less than half a dollar for 2.4 years of treatment. The authors also impute the additional teacher salaries to maintain the class sizes at pre-program levels due to increasing enrollment, and they impute the cost per unit of schooling. The benefits are the higher earnings in the treatment group, and they can also add the value of health benefits or reduce childhood illness using willingness to pay surveys. These are not included in these calculations, but they can be included if one wants to do so. They also impute government revenue gains in Kenya that are 16.5% on average of total income, and what the authors did was to compute the net present value of earnings gains, government revenue, and social internet rate of return over working life, and this is illustrated in the next slide. This figure shows the relatively small costs in dark gray in the first five to ten years of the program and the increased earning gains over the lifetime of the individual. In this particular example, the authors show that over 50 years the social internal rate of return of the deworming program per annum is 42.1 percent, a huge cost-benefit relationship. What have we learned from this program? Childhood health investment in Kenya led to improved adult living standards and labor market earnings 10 to 20 years later, and the implications are that these health investments for school-aged children can still have meaningful impacts on adult life outcomes. The interesting part is that the project goes on and it will have even longer run results. The Kenya Life Panel Survey is collecting data on the children of the original participants in the program and so we will have, in a few years, evidence on the effect of this deworming program on the intergenerational transmission of poverty. So what we have shown with this case study are very high long-run investment returns from a simple low-cost intervention, and we will have shown this by means of a randomized control trial. This is certainly Nobel Prize material. We can also derive a series of lessons for long-run randomized control trials relations from different experiences in cash transfer programs. We will start in Honduras with a paper called Experimental Long-Term Effects of Early Childhood and School-Age Exposure to a Conditional Cash Transfer Program by Molina Milan and other authors, published in the Journal of Development Economics in 2020. 
The program consisted of a conditional cash transfer program implemented in Honduras for five years in the early 2000s. The program and its evaluation were modeled after Progressa. The authors rely on the municipal level randomized assignment of the program to estimate the long-term effect 13 years after the program began. What the authors did was use census data from later years identifying where the adults in the census were born to see whether they were from municipalities that had or didn't have the program. So these are intent to treat effects computed at an individual level from the census which allows assignments of individuals to their municipality of birth, thereby circumventing migration selection concerns. In this figure, we can see the long-term impacts of the program on grades attained by non-Indigenous females. We can see that the effect is positive by about 0.2 to 0.6 for females in the age range 6 to 19 in 2013. All in all, the program finds that for non-Indigenous beneficiaries, there are positive and robust impacts on educational outcomes for the cohort subjected to the program for a wide age range. They find increases of more than 50% for secondary completion rates and also positive effects in the probability of reaching university studies for those who were exposed at school going ages. The authors also find substantive gains for grades attained and for current enrollment for those that were exposed during early childhood raising the possibility of further gains forward. These educational gains are, however, more limited for the indigenous, which in Honduras are those who are in the lower part of the educational attainment distribution to start with. So the effects were concentrated on those that were better off. Finally, the exposure to the conditional cash transfer program increased the probability of international migration for young men from 3 to 7 percentage points and this effect was also stronger for non-Indigenous individuals. What this long-run evaluation has shown is that early childhood exposure to nutrition and health components and exposure during school-going ages to the educational component of the program led to sustained increases in human capital for participants. This study was included in a wider meta-study of long-run conditional cash transfer programs by Molina Milan and other co-authors, published in the World Bank Research Observer in 2019. Citing these conditional cash transfer studies, the authors state that most studies find positive long-term effects on schooling, but fewer find positive effects on cognitive skills, learning, or socio-emotional skills. While some of these studies are non-experimental, there are several large-scale randomized control trials in their sample of studies. The impacts on employment and earnings are mixed, possibly because former beneficiaries are often still too young, but a number of studies find that they are not statistically different from zero for most outcomes, which can be attributed in some cases to methodological challenges facing long-term evaluations. Most notably, the collection of data over the long run, along with sample sizes that might not be enough to reach statistical power levels that would give statistically significant effects. One of the conclusions from these authors is that developing further opportunities for analysis with rigorous identification strategies for the measurement of long-term impacts should be high on the research agenda. They also state that as original beneficiaries age, this should also be increasingly possible, and indeed important, before concluding whether or not conditional cash transfer programs have led to sustainable poverty reduction. Besides conditional cash transfer programs, there are other types of transfer programs for the poor that can be evaluated and compared with randomized control trials. We will first start with a multi-country, multi-program study called a multifaceted program causes lasting progress for the very poor. Evidence from six countries by Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Dufflow, and other co-authors published in Science in 2015. What is the starting point of the debate? In this classification by Oriana Bandiera, we have basically two views of poverty with different policy implications. 
On the one hand, some analysts think that poverty is due to the fact that individuals have equal access to opportunity but have different traits, whereas for others what is going on is that individuals have basically the same traits but have unequal access to opportunity. For the first view, people have different innate traits which determines their standards of living and their initial endowment does not really matter if allocation of talent is efficient. For this view of poverty, we should have social protection programs such as the conditional cash transfer programs and others we've seen before. If we believe that individuals have unequal access to opportunity and people have different access to circumstances that determine their standards of living, then initial endowments matter and talent is misallocated. For this view of poverty, we would need more programs that provide large asset and skill transfers and thus help individuals get out of a poverty trap. Of course, no one has exactly one or the other view, but these are two broad categorizations of views as to why people stay poor. One emphasizes differences in fundamentals such as ability, talent, or motivation, but the other, which we can call the poverty traps view, highlights differences in opportunities that stem from differences in wealth. The graduation approach, summarized by Professor Sheldon from Yale, was developed by BRAC, the largest non-governmental organization in the world. BRAC is based in Bangladesh and has been working on microfinance and small business development for 35 years. The observation is that some individuals were regularly excluded from the NGO's programs. These families had been excluded, not in the current generation, but one generation earlier. These were the extreme poor in already poor villages. The observation by BRAC practitioners was that traditional development interventions, such as microcredits, were not enough for this group of people, since they were in poverty traps. For these people, BRAC developed the Targeting the Ultra Poor Graduation Program that combines a series of sequence interventions. At the core is the view that these extremely poor households need resources and opportunities to be able to engage with the marketplace and create sustainable livelihoods that support them, their families, and their villages. The methodology involves consumption support, transfer of technical skills by use of training, transfers of assets, training in financial literacy, and exposure to savings in order to generate a change in the trajectory towards sustainable livelihood. The program requires from 18 to 36 months and everyone knows from the beginning that this is a limited time intervention. In this figure by Banerjee and others we can see the six elements of the targeted ultra-poor program. These elements are coordinated production asset transfers, savings, health interventions, home visits, consumption support, and technical skills training. In this figure from the BRAC analysis and its definition of the graduation program, we can see that the graduation program has four pillars, social protection, livelihood promotion, financial inclusion, and social empowerment. There is a description of the intermediate interventions that lead to the desired outcomes in the column to the right. In this figure, also from the BRAC definition and documentation about this graduation program, we can observe how BRAC expects the intervention to affect beneficiaries over their lifetime. In their paper in Science, Banerjee, Dufflo, and others present the results from six randomized control trials of this integrated approach from the graduation intervention that aims to improve the livelihood among the very poor. The approach combines the six elements we described and focuses on women in ultra-poor households. In this slide, we can see the timeline of the program and its evaluation with the baseline data collection, an asset transfer and consumption support period, and the data collection in intermediate and end-line points. The results of the paper are very interesting and very clear. For most countries in the sample, households end up with more assets than the control group, with larger effects in Ethiopia and India, medium effects in Ghana and Pakistan, small positive effects in Peru, and negative effects in Honduras where there was a problem with the implementation of the program. 
The households also have higher consumption levels in all countries except for Honduras, with lower effects for Peru and higher effects for the rest of the countries. We can see in this figure a very clever and nice graphical way of presenting the effects of the program for several outcomes in the six countries in the sample. We can see that we have positive and significant effects in different dimensions, with only a few that are consistent across the board. In this figure, we can see the results for all the countries pooled together, which shows that there are substantial effects on consumption, food security, and assets, positive effects on financial outcomes such as borrowing, higher revenue from livestock, and better mental health indices. Perhaps one of the disappointing dimensions is that the authors do not find any positive significant effect on women's decision making when looking at the aggregate data for the six countries. What are the conclusions from the Banerjee et al. study of the graduation into sustainable livelihood programs? The results from the implementation of the same basic program, which were adapted to a wide variety of geographical and institutional contexts, and with multiple implementations partners, show statistically significant cost-effective impacts on consumption, fueled mostly by increases in self-employment income, and better psychosocial status for targeted households. The impact on the poor lasted at least a year after all implementations ended, and it is possible to make sustainable improvements in the economic status of the poor with relatively short-term interventions that transfers to them assets and other things like skills and literacy. However, these evaluations from six countries, while interesting, still refer to relatively short runs. We have addressed a very important question whether households can escape from poverty. We have looked at this from a very interesting intervention that was adapted to six different countries with different implementation partners. But we can also take a look at the results from programs of this type in the longer run. This is what was done by Oriana Bandiera and co-authors in a paper called Labor Markets and Poverty in Village Economies published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics in 2017. As we have just said, the graduation into sustainable livelihoods provides compelling multi-site evidence on the short-run impact of graduation. But there are a series of papers that have studied longer-term results of the same problems. These papers are somehow more sophisticated and leverage BRAC evaluation in the medium run over a period of seven years. They evaluate the presence of poverty traps over this longer term, and they test whether asset transfers can help the ultra-poor, above the trap threshold, escape poverty. So these are big push type of interventions in village economies evaluated over the long term. What did Bandiera and co-authors do? They studied BRAC's program in rural Bangladesh. They looked at how women's choices of labor activities in the village economies are correlated with poverty, and whether enabling the poorest women to take on the activities of their richer counterparts can set them on a sustainable trajectory out of poverty. What the authors found is that wealthier women attend livestock and do other types of work, while poorer women concentrate on domestic help and other activities that are not as well rewarded. These randomized control trials covered 21,000 households in 1,309 villages that were surveyed four times over a seven-year period. The trials evaluated whether these nationwide programs in Bangladesh that transfer livestock assets and skills to the less wealthy women allow them to escape poverty. As we mentioned at the beginning, the poorer women are mostly engaged in low return and seasonal causal wage labor, whereas wealthier women were solely engaged in livestock rearing. What are the results of the program? They can be summarized in this figure. We can see that after seven years, there is a substantial increase in productive assets and also a substantial increase in total consumption. And so, the more detailed evidence shows how women in these households moved into livestock rearing, and that's how, by means of the asset transfer of livestock, they increased their productive assets and they managed to increase their consumption. 
This is also shown in this table from the Bandiera et al. paper that illustrates the treatment effects on the labor supply and earnings of ultra-poor women. It shows that labor supply, in terms of hours and days, increased with the program as well as earnings, but that this was mostly due to a reduction in the number of days and hours worked as a maid and an increase in time devoted to agriculture. In this table, we can see that after four years, the program reduced participants' share in poverty, increased their consumption, the value of their assets, their savings, and indicated whether the household received loans and also whether they gave loans. In Table 10 from the same paper, we can see that after seven years, the program also managed to increase all these dimensions, expenditure assets, savings, and the value of productive assets. All in all, the program enabled poor women to start engaging in livestock rearing with higher labor supply and earnings. The results showed that asset accumulation and poverty reduction were sustained after four and then seven years with no externalities, meaning the authors did not find any crowding out of non-eligible households' livestock. They found positive spillover on wages for casual jobs as the poor reduced their labor supply. So the program's evaluation results showed that the poor are able to take on the work activities of the non-poor but face barriers to doing so. This program was one of the interventions that removed these barriers and led to sustainable poverty reduction. This analysis supports the poverty trap view of poverty. They identified a threshold level of initial assets above which households could accumulate assets and had better occupations that allowed them to escape poverty. The reverse happened for those who stayed below the threshold. The authors also developed a structural estimation analysis that showed that it is the misallocation of work for the ultra-poor that is to blame for their situation and that the gains from reducing this misallocation far exceed the cost of the program. The findings imply that big push policies that transform job opportunities should be explored more often in developing countries. While graduation may not be a panacea, and it has some well-grounded critiques, these studies show that we can produce good evidence to inform the debate thanks to large-scale, complex, randomized control trials that address important questions for long-run economic development. In conclusion, what can we say about randomized control trials for long-run outcomes? There is a recent meta-study published in the Annual Review of Economics by Bougain, Huang, Kremer, and Miguel called Using Randomized Controlled Trials to Estimate Long-Run Impacts in Development Economics that shows the following. The authors assess the evidence from randomized controlled trials on long-run economic opportunities and living standards in poor countries. They find that several studies estimate large positive long-run impacts, but that relatively few existing randomized control trials have been evaluated over the long run. They did a systematic survey of existing randomized control trials focusing on cash transfer and child health programs like we did in this module, and they posit that more long-run evaluations are feasible through the collection of new panel longitudinal data with improved participant tracking methods, such as what we saw in the Kenya and the Bangladesh papers. These papers followed individuals over longer periods of time through alternative research designs, for instance looking at census data as in the Honduras paper, and by means of access to administrative census by cell phone data. The conclusion of their paper states that since roughly the year 2000, the rise of development economics randomized control trials provides a novel opportunity to generate high quality evidence on the long run drivers of living standards. This figure shows how randomized control trials in low and middle income countries from 1995 to 2015 have increased from less than 50 in 2004 to about 400 in 2015. In conclusion, randomized control trials helped us answer important policy questions for long-run development 
and they helped us distinguish between views with different policy implications. They may not provide the ultimate answer to every long-run economic development question, but they have still produced good evidence to address important and big questions and have been informative for policy debates and also with mechanisms. What is next? We need to address more of these big questions. We need to produce more evidence from diverse contexts and more follow-up studies and data for long-run impact assessments.